December the 31st, 1995, there was a new book that was released and that it really become a runaway bestseller. It produced 15 more volumes. It eventually sold more than 65 million copies. And we know it today as the Left Behind series. Now I'm going to tell you, it's not Bible. There's a lot of things in there. It's interesting, but it's not Bible. I'm just going to say that. But I'm going to say this, that Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins were the authors of, that, of those books, and they stated that the inspiration for the Left Behind series was the 1972 Christian film called A Thief in the Night. And I can remember as a teenager watching A Thief in the Night. And what is it about? It's what will happen in this world when the rapture takes place. And God used that and people got saved. But they also said it was based upon Hal Lindsey's book, The Late Great Planet Earth. And I would submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, that the study of the end time events is a passion that many of God's people have today. Here's the unfortunate thing, and I believe it is unfortunate, that many believers get so caught up in the study of end time events that they ignore the basic principles that the end time events were supposed to produce and that is spiritual growth and evangelism because instead of just looking for well i'm waiting for jesus to come we're supposed to be becoming more like jesus christ we're supposed to be reaching our culture our society with the gospel because jesus is coming back and when he comes back it's going to be late for a lot of people too late for people that have heard the gospel and rejected it to be saved. But I would say this also, there are many unbelievers today that are interested about the future as well. Most newspapers carry a horoscope. But that's not going to help you because they know no, they don't know any more than other people do that think they know what's going on. There are people that are looking at the farmer's almanac and they're looking at stock spoc, uh, speculations and they're looking to people like Nostradamus who predicted the future. But here's the thing: although many people can predict many things about the future, nobody knows exactly what's going to happen. And, and listen, I can tell you who do, who does know God. And everything that the Lord put in this Bible today tells us exactly what's going to take place down the road in the near future. Now, I, I want you to understand that the Word of God paints a very vivid picture of what's coming in the end times. And I wish I had time, but I don't, it's not really the purpose of this message today to talk about that. But I want you to listen to this. Everything that's going to happen in the end times is going to revolve around a nation called Israel. And Israel's in the news a lot. And I'm just here to tell you, if you wonder what's going on in the world, look at Israel. Because God's time clock has everything to do with that nation in the end times. Not America. America's not found in prophecy, which is kind of interesting since we seem to be a superpower. And I don't even know what to read into that other than to say this. America is not what you need to be watching. You need to be watching Israel because God has a purpose and a plan for the nation of Israel. All right. So Paul wrote this letter to the Thessalonican church and these people in this church had been saved for just a few months. They hadn't been saved very long. And Paul had taught them about end time events. And now some of these believers, they were struggling with how to reconcile their understanding about the return of Christ with the recent death of some of their fellow believers that have already gone on to heaven. And they feared that those who had died uh, uh, died and been and been saved they thought man these people are going to miss the rapture they don't even know what's coming and they're going to miss that and to make matters worse there were false teachers that had infiltrated these people and said no no you've already missed the rapture and and they were creating they were creating confusion and they were circulating a letter they said was from the apostle paul you can read about that in second thessalonians chapter 2 verse 1 and 2 and then when you consider the ongoing suffering that these believers were going through and you consider the persecution that they were that they were facing they were convinced we've missed the rapture oh no oh no we're experiencing the day of the lord what are we going to do and i think you can see how these believers were shaken and they were confused so the apostle paul under divine inspiration wrote this passage not to give us a detailed description of the rapture. That's not what he's doing here. He's, he's writing this, watch this, verse 18, to give comfort to believers. 
That's the whole point. He was trying to alleviate their grief and their confusion. So notice with me in verse number 13. We're going to preach here in just a second. I'm just setting the groundwork here. I want you to see this. In verse number 13, he said, I would, I would not have you to be ignorant. The word ignorant simply means this, unacquainted with. I don't want you to be unacquainted with this. I want you to know what's going on. And he says, them which are asleep. Sleep in the New Testament. Look up here. Sleep in the New Testament always refers to your body, never to your soul. Because if you're saved, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. If you're not saved, listen, the last breath you take on this planet is not the end of life. Oh, the body's going to stay behind and it's going to look like it's asleep. But if you're not saved, sir, if you're not saved, ma'am, the moment you take the last breath, your soul goes to a place called hell. Don't you know, Brother Rocky, people don't believe in hell. It doesn't matter where people believe in hell or not. It's still a fact. Gravity is a fact. And it doesn't matter how many people say, I don't like gravity. It works every time you fall off a building. And there is a hell, to, there is a hell to shun and there is a heaven to gain. So I can remember as a child going to the first funeral that I ever went to and this individual was in a casket and I said, it looks like they're sleeping. Because that's how death is referred to the body in the Bible, asleep. But I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, your soul is not asleep. Your soul is either in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ or it is tormented in hell where it will be for all eternity. All right. So Paul is relating this information to these believers. Watch this. So they would not sorrow even as others which have no hope. Okay. There is a normal sorrow that accompanies the death of a loved one. That's normal. My mom's, uh, she went to heaven about seven years ago and I'm gonna tell you I cried because I was gonna miss her, but I'm telling you, I know right where she's at, she's in heaven. I, listen, I was not in despair because I know where she's at, she's in the presence of the Lord. That's not what Paul's talking about here. Not talking about that. There is a terrifying, hopeless, finality for unbelievers when someone dies. There's nothing to look forward to. I have some things here that I came across several years ago. It was quite interesting, and this is not recent, but it happened in the recent past. And there was a man named Voltaire. And Voltaire was an agnostic, well, he was an atheist, and he wrote many volumes about the Christian faith and Jesus Christ and blasphemed him. And when it came to his deathbed, here's what he said, and I quote, O oh Christ, O oh Lord Jesus, I must die abandoned by God and man. His condition became so terrible that his associates were afraid to approach his bedside. As he died, his nurse said, I would never attend the bedside of another atheist to see them die. Voltaire denied God, but when he died, he was looking at God. And he died in his sins. I'm here to tell you, friends, you don't want to die in your sins because there's no hope. There was another man. His name was Adams. He was an infidel. And just before he died, he said, I am lost, lost, lost. I am damned forever. And his agony was so great that he pulled hair out of his head. Don't you tell me there's no hell. Don't you tell me there's no afterlife. Because I'm going to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, I go on and on today. There are people that die without Jesus Christ and they have no hope. There were two men that died in the year 1899. The first man was named, a man named Robert Green Ingersoll. And he wrote books like The Mistakes of Moses. And he went up and down this country and he criticized the Bible and he blasphemed God. But he died and when he died, there was no hope. There was nothing to look forward to. Later that year in 1899, in the month of December, there was another man that died. His name was Dwight L. Moody. And Dwight L. Moody on his deathbed said, I see heaven open. I'm looking into heaven. He went, he left this world with calm assurance. I'm here to tell you, for a child of God, there's calm assurance when you leave this world. If you don't know Jesus Christ, there's nothing to look forward to. That's what Paul is talking about here when he said, I, when we, uh, he said, I don't want you to sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. And if you are a child of God today, we've got hope. I know where I'm going. I'm going to heaven. 
I want to make sure I say this. I'm going to heaven not because I'm a Baptist. I'm going to heaven not because I've been baptized. I'm not going to heaven because I'm a pretty good husband and I'm a pretty good dad and I'm a pretty good Bible teacher. I'm just a good old Joe. No, 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 ladies and gentlemen. I am going to heaven because I am a sinner that deserves to go to hell, but because of God's grace and God's mercy and God's love, I repented of my sins and I received him as my personal savior. When I was seven years old, can I tell you this? He saved me. I don't deserve to go to heaven, but I'm thankful I'm going to heaven because of what Jesus Christ did for me on the cross of Calvary. All right, so I want you to notice this. We're talking about the rapture. So watch this. There is a four, I'm gonna call it this way, a four-fold description that the Apostle Paul, under divine inspiration, gives about the rapture here in this passage. So I want you to notice this again. I'm not gonna read it. It's right there in your Bible. Verse 14 and verse number 15. The blessed hope of the rapture is not based on the shifting sands of some philosophical speculation. It is not based upon some religious mytho mythology out here. It is not a fable that has been concocted by well-meaning men just trying to comfort those who grieve. No, ladies and gentlemen, the rapture is based on, a, on three unshakable truths. This is what I call the foundation of the rapture. What is it based upon? Look at verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died, stop right there. Jesus Christ's death satisfied the demands of God's holiness and his justice and his righteousness by paying the full penalty for a believer's sin. In fact, he died for the whole world. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And by virtue of Christ's substitutionary death on the cross and the blood that was shed and that blood that was placed on the mercy seat in heaven that speaks better things than that of Abel, according to Hebrews chapter number 12. Can I just tell you today, I am saved because of what Jesus did. He died for me. He was my substitute. If you're gonna go to heaven, you need somebody to be your substitute. Somebody's got to take your place. And you can either accept Jesus Christ or you can go to hell and pay for your sins for all eternity. But you get the choice. And Paul is saying that the foundation of the rapture, first of all, is based upon the death of Jesus Christ. But then he said this also in verse number 14, he rose again. The resurrection of Jesus Christ indicates that the father accepted Jesus Christ's sacrifice, enabling him, watch this, to be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Romans chapter 3, verse 26. In fact, Romans chapter 4, verse number 25, Paul said he was raised again for our justification. I am justified because Jesus died and rose again and I received him as my personal savior. How do you go to heaven? You got to trust Jesus Christ. He's got to become your substitute. But the point that Paul is making is that Jesus' resurrection proves that he conquered sin and he conquered death and he became the source of resurrection life for every believer. Right now, I have eternal life in me. Amen. And when I fall over dead, whenever that happens, I'm going to heaven because I'm a sinner saved by God's amazing grace. So the rapture is based upon the death of Christ. It is based upon the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then notice this. I love this. I tried to emphasize it. For this we send you by the word of the Lord. Paul's teaching on the rapture was not his own speculation. It was direct revelation from God. And the rapture does not rest on the shaky foundation of some theological speculation out here. It rests on the sure foundation of the word of Jesus Christ. So I can say I'm standing on the Bible because this is what Jesus taught. This is what Jesus said here. That's what Paul is saying. And listen, Jesus' death and his resurrection and the revelation of Jesus Christ, I'm here to tell you that the rapture stands, sets on a very firm foundation today. So this isn't rocky hair. This is the word of God. Number two, look at this here. Look at verse number 15, the last part there. He said uh, that we that we, that are, are you seeing the we part there? Yes, that we, 
which are alive and remain and the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. So not only do we have the foundation of the rapture, but Paul says in verse number 15, let's talk about the participation of the rapture. Let's talk about those who are going to participate in it. And there are two groups that are going to participate in the rapture. First of all, those who are alive. Number two, those who are asleep. Now, notice the we. I love this. Notice the we. That indicates Paul believed that he would see the rapture in his day. He was looking forward to it. Hey, folks, I'm not looking forward to a hole in the ground. If I get to live a normal life 70 years, and that's about 13 years away, if I get to live a normal life, I really believe I'm going to see Jesus come in my lifetime. Well, Rocky, people have been saying that for thousands of years. I know, but we ought to live with that reality that he's going to come back in our lifetime because the apostle Paul did and he believed that Jesus was going to come back and he had a proper anticipation and he had a proper expectation for the Lord's return. I submit to you this morning, you and I should do the same thing. We should be looking for Jesus Christ to be coming back and Paul did not predict a specific time and Paul reassured these believers at Thessalonica that those who died are not going to miss the rapture, which, listen, he also included them which are asleep. The living shall not prevent. You know what prevent means? It simply means this. It means to beforehand or get a head start or proceed. In other words, the living will not take presidents over them or gain an advantage over them. Those who die before the rapture will in no sense be superior to those, inferior to those who are alive. So you know what? If I don't, if I don't live to see the rapture, that'll be all right. I'll be in the presence of the Lord. But when he comes back, I'll be there too. That's what he's talking about. Alive, and those that have passed away, those that have gone to heaven, they are not in any way, those that have died, they're all going to participate in the rapture. Now watch this here, verse 16, 17, real quick, look at this here. I want you to notice that the apostle Paul gives an explanation concerning the rapture. He tells us exactly what it is here. So what are we to expect when the, when the rapture takes place? Well, let's look and see what the Bible says. It's right here laid out for us. He said, first of all, the Lord himself is gonna descend. He's going to return for the saints. I'm so thankful he's not sending Michael to get us or Gabriel or some other angel. The Bible tells us that he himself is coming back to get his people. He only does that. He says he's going to descend from heaven. That's where he's been since he ascended. And in Acts chapter 1, the angel said in verses 9, 10, 11, this same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. He's coming back. Hey, when he comes back to the rapture, he's not coming back to planet earth. That'll happen seven years later. That's called the second coming. But when we talk about the rapture, he's coming to receive his saints. Notice this. It's going to be with a shout. Shout is a military word. The commander would shout and call his troops to fall in line. And the dead, the dead in Christ, listen, ladies and gentlemen, they are going to be resurrected at the Lord's command. You know where you see a picture of this? John chapter 11, verse 43 in the cemetery, when Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. Now, I can't be dogmatic about this, but I can say it. If he just said, come forth, I think everybody in that cemetery would come out. Because one of these days he's going to say, come up hither. And we're all going up. Anyway, I'm just telling you, it's going to be with a shout. And then the voice of the archangel, the only archangel in the Bible is Michael. He's going to sound. He's going to add his voice to the Lord's shout of command. And it's going to be with the trump of God. Listen to this. Trumpets were used in the, in the, in the, in the Old Testament for different reasons. They sounded at Israel's feast. They sounded at Israel's convocations, at their celebrations, to sound an alarm to, in a time of war for the people to assemble them themselves together, whatever was necessary. If they had to get the crowd, if they had to get the people together, they blew the trumpet. The purpose here seems to be to assemble the saints in the glorified bodies. Oh, hang on here real quick. See, when you die, your body goes in the ground or wherever it goes. Your soul goes to heaven. But at the rapture, whoo! God's going to take your body and it's going to be incorruptible and he's going to take your soul and put it back with your body and you're going to have a body like Jesus Christ. It's called the first resurrection. Now that ain't happened yet, but it's a fiction to one of these days at the rapture. Mercy. 
And then he said this, the dead in Christ shall rise. The dead saints will in no wise be inferior to those alive at the rapture because their glorified bodies are gonna join with their glorified spirits to make them into the image of Jesus Christ. And then notice this. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up. Now caught up there is a strong, irresistible act. A strong, irresistible act. It is actually where we get the term rapture from, caught up. Now that word, as I said a while ago, it is used in different parts of the New Testament not to describe the rapture. They're just talking about different things in the context. We're gonna see here in just quickly, but I'm telling you what they talk about talks about the rapture. So let me give you an example. I've got four of them here. Uh, this word is used to catch away speedily. In Acts chapter eight, in verse number 39, Philip has just got through preaching to the Ethiopian eunuch. He gets saved, he gets baptized. And the Bible says the spirit of the Lord caught away Philip that the eunuch saw him no more. What does that mean? He just disappeared. And one of these days, millions and millions of people from all over this planet are just gonna be gone. Time out. And if you're sitting here saying, I'll tell you, I'll believe it then. And if you have rejected the gospel, according to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse number 11, verse number 12, you're going to believe the lie, whatever the lie is. And God's going to send you strong delusion. You will not be able to get saved if you've rejected the gospel. So don't be saying, I'll get saved after that happens. You're going to believe whatever the lie is. Anyway. Millions of people one of these days are just going to disappear from the planet. Amen. Number two, it was used to seize by force. In John chapter six and verse number 15, Jesus just fed 5,000 people. And the Bible says when Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force, by force, that's the same word as caught up, by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. It means to seize by force. One of these days I'm going to be seized by a force I've never felt in my life. God's going to take me and he's going to take me to heaven. Now, if you're sitting here saying, well, how in the world is that going to happen? How's he going to distinguish it between all the billions of people on planet earth? All right, here's a, here's a little illustration. If you were to go to a salvage yard, an automobile salvage yard, and they had a big electron magnet and they would put that over a car, that car would be pulled up to that magnet. You know why? Because it has the same nature. And the Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse number 4, that you and I are partakers of the divine nature. The Holy Spirit of God indwells me because I'm saved. And ladies and gentlemen, when the Lord says, come up hither, I'm going to be seized by a force that I've never felt before, and I'm going in the presence of the Lord. Number three, it was used to move to a new place. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, in verse number 2, the Bible says that Paul was caught up to the third heaven. And one of these days, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to be transplanted, transplanted to a new place called Jerusalem. The new Jerusalem. Heaven, where Jesus Christ is. I'm looking forward to that. Here's the fourth way it's used, and I'm going to say this, I'm going to make a statement. The fourth way it was used is in Acts chapter 23 in verse number 10. And it means to rescue from danger. And Paul here has got himself in a situation and he's between Pharisees and Sadducees in the context and the chief captain fearing lest Paul should have been pulled in pieces of them commanded the soldiers to go down and take him, what's this, by force. Same word is caught up. By force from among them and to bring him into the castle. What does that mean? Kept him from being killed. Okay. So I'll say this as nice as I know how. I'm not looking for the tribulation. I'm not looking for any Christ. I'm not looking for 666. I'm looking for Jesus. There is no way, if you read the Bible honestly, there's no way that God's gonna let you go through the tribulation. He's, hey, it's a blessed hope, not a blessed hope. And he's not gonna allow his bride to go through that tribulation. But hey, if you still believe that, maybe the Lord will let you stay behind. Have your way at it, okay? I'm, somebody says, Harold, you're just chicken. You're right. Buck, 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 buck. I don't want to stay behind because I've read Revelation. I know what's coming and I want to get out of here. Hey, more than that, more than that, I want to see Jesus. I want to be with him. 
So we're going to be caught up and watch this. It's going to happen. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in the moment, in the twink of an eye, we shall be changed and we're going to meet the Lord and to meet is meeting a very important person. A royal person, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And you and I could never encounter anyone more important than our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Mercy sakes alive. I'm talking about Paul said, here's what you can expect when the rapture takes place. Now watch this, and I'm almost done, but you gotta get this. So look at verse 18. The reason Paul wrote these believers was for this reason. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Now comfort simply means this, it means to aid, it means to help, to comfort, to encourage. If the truth of the rapture does not encourage us, then pray tell me what will. I mean, I, one of the great things about traveling in the summertime, it really is, I, don't, I, I really don't, I don't turn the TV on. I don't watch it, I don't look at it, I don't need it. I certainly don't need to hear all the negative stuff out here in the news. Amen, Brother Rocky, that's right, because it's all negative. It's all from a point of view. But I'm here to tell you, when you want encouragement, think about Jesus coming to receive you unto himself. Think about being in the presence of Jesus Christ. Because I'm telling you, that is a very encouraging message. So Paul doesn't say that we should take this truth and set a date. Paul didn't say, sell all your possessions and go to the highest mountain and put a sheet around you and wait for Jesus to come back. That's not what we're supposed to do. The Lord wants us to take this knowledge and use it to cheer and to comfort each other. And when we grieve, we need to be encouraged with the truth. So sorrow will not permeate our life and despair because we know where our loved one's at if they're saved. So we know the Lord's coming back, we just don't know when he's coming back. So here's what we need to do. Stay with me. Here's what we need to do. Here's an old, this is an old Missouri saying, we need to pull out all the stops. We need to do everything we can because the Lord's coming back. This is not a time to lay down. This is not a time to, this is not a time to play games. This is not a time to play church. This is time to get busy because the Lord's coming back. And when the Lord comes back, listen to me. When the Lord comes back, there'll be no more soul winning. There'll be no more witnessing. It's all going to be over for us. We're going to be in the presence of the Lord. So if we're going to do anything, we got to do it today, today, today. Today is the day that we've got to get busy. You know why? The Lord's coming back. It's coming back. So we know the Lord's come back, we, we just don't know when. So here's the question. Will the rapture be an embarrassing intrusion into your life or a glorious climax to a life that you have lived for Jesus Christ? This is a true story. I believe it happened in Dallas, Texas many years ago. There was a man that did a very foolish thing. He left his car running in the winter time and went into a quick market to get some coffee and came back and his car was gone. On, on his car keys, there was a house key, office keys and things like that. And so he, he, oh man, I can't believe I left my car running. And so he went home, filed a police report, got up the next day, car sitting in the driveway. It's been washed, it's been waxed. There's a note in there saying, sir, I'm sorry. I, I found your address here on the ID card and I'm sorry about that. I had an emergency come up, but just to show you, there's no hard feelings. I gave you two tickets to the 50 yard line at Dallas Cowboys football game this weekend. The guy said, mercy. I thought I'd lost all hope in human nature. And he went to the football game and came home and his house was cleaned out. You're gonna have to think about that, you'll get it. You, you wake up middle of the night and say, oh yeah! <laughs> I'm here to tell you, that's what's gonna happen when the rapture takes place for a lot of God's people. Oh, oh. And you haven't lived a life for the Lord? Oh, you're saved, you're saved, you're under the blood, but you have nothing to show for it. And I'll be thankful you'll be in heaven. I'll be glad you'll be in heaven. But I'm gonna tell you, what are you gonna have to show for it? Someone said this, you may be ready for heaven, but you're not ready to meet the Lord. And can I tell you, you're not ready to meet the Lord 
if you're into pornography. You're not ready to meet the Lord if you're not tithing. You're not willing, you're not ready to meet the Lord if you got the wrong kind of music in your life. You're not ready to meet the Lord. I'm not saying you're not saved. I'm just saying you're not ready to meet the Lord. You're not ready to meet the Lord if you've got some, I don't know, let's just call it what it is. Worldliness, gossip, bitterness in your life. You're not ready to meet the Lord as a child of God. I'm not saying you're not saved. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, you're not ready to meet the Lord. And if we believe the Lord is coming back, if we're saying, you know what? He could come back today. He could come back before we get to the lunch table. Can I tell you? I'd certainly want to meet him right because I'm going to tell you, it's going to be hard to be standing in the, Lord, in the, in the presence of the Lord and have tall, tall I'm saying right, tall in your mouth because where are you going to spit? That's disgusting. It's disgusting that people would do it. Amen, Brother Rocky. I'm just here to tell you there are things, and you don't have Brother Rocky to go down in a laundry list of everything you're doing, but I'm telling you this. If you're saved today, the Spirit of God can say, you're not ready to meet the Lord. You got this in your life. You got this worldliness in your life. You got this entertainment in your life. You got this stuff in your life that needs to get out. You're not reading your Bible. You're not praying. You're not going soul winning. You're not ready to meet the Lord. And I'm here to tell you, if you believe the rapture's coming, you ought to make things right. If you're here today and you do not know Jesus Christ, your personal savior, can I say this to you today? I, I'm asking you, I'm pleading with you, don't walk out of these doors today and not get this settled about your sins being forgiven, your sins being pardoned, because you're not assured that you'll even make it to where you're headed after this service. Because the Lord could come back. And I want to remind you again, it'll be too late. If you say, you know, I understand what you're saying, Brother Rocky, but I'm just not ready to do it. If you willingly, knowingly reject the gospel, I'm here to tell you, not Harold's opinion, Paul's authoritative inspired word, you can't be saved. So I want to encourage you. If you don't know where you're going when you leave this world, you don't know where you're going when you die. If you're in a car accident, I'm just telling you, I wanna, I wanna challenge you, I wanna plead with you. Remember Jesus died for you and he shed his blood for you and he was buried and he rose again so he could be your personal savior. And I'm so thankful, I'm so thankful that he loves us and he died for us.